tonight we're going to get started a little bit early. We're going to be looking at the topic of what does the Bible say about the gift of tongues? Now, I realize this is a controversial topic, one that uh, people are, feel very strongly about, one side or another side. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this tonight. And I know we got a little, of a, little bit of a late start, but we're going to try to uh, talk about this until 7 p.m. And then we're going to go and start our uh, regular nightly meeting. So before we launch into it, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Lord, we want your Holy Spirit. We don't want to fight about your Holy Spirit. We want truth. We want the gifts that you have for us so we can help spread your word. Lord, help us tonight to study the subject uh, and let us see from your word what you actually say about the gift of tongues. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so, really, there are three basic views that are fairly popular out there about the gift of tongues. The, uh, the most popular view, and the, it's growing uh, among Pentecostals, Charismatics, and the non-denominational movement, is this view that the gift of tongues is something that every Christian can, and some teach even should, experience. Um, perhaps in your, in your life sometimes somebody has approached you and said, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not born again. Or if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. And so some people, and that's kind of on the extreme side of it. You don't hear that from everybody who uh, emphasizes the gift of tongues. But the gift of tongues, if you like, uh, for example, some churches, I was, I'm from Springfield, Missouri. That's the headquarters of a very large Pentecostal denomination. And uh, I, st- I was studying with them for about a year. And during that time, uh, the goal was to get me to the place where I could start speaking in tongues for myself. And uh, that was an interesting experience going through that because I was a brand new baby Christian. I'll tell you more about that experience tomorrow of me growing as a Christian. But, uh, but that's really one, that's one view about the gift of tongues, that, that it's a gift for everyone. It's a gift that will bless your spiritual life. It's a gift that will build you up. Um, it's a gift for you to um, really experience God at a deeper level. That's really how it's being emphasized. The, the other view, and it's really uh, quite the opposite view, and that is that all spiritual gifts ceased with the canon of the Bible. So when the Bible came along, no more spiritual gifts. No need for spiritual gifts. God wasn't going to give anymore. Uh, we have the Word of God. We just don't need gifts at all. And so that includes prophets. It includes apostles, uh, which I wonder why they stopped there, because there's also the gifts of pastors and teachers. Um, but they don't say that necessarily stop. But they say the miraculous gifts, the gifts of healing, the gifts of discernment, the gifts of, of, of miracles, that those gifts, the gift of faith, those, all those gifts were apostolic gifts that were used um, until the church can get the Bible. And then after that came, no more gifts. That's the second view. Um, the view that I personally take, and I'm going to uh, share about tonight, isn't the first or the other one. It's the view that basically says this. God gave the gift of tongues to the church to be a tool to save souls. It is an instrument of salvation. Not, not, let me rephrase that. It's an instrument to reach people for the purpose of salvation. God gave the gift of tongues uh, to believers to utilize, to be able to spread the gospel, essentially. And this is bare, bore out, you can read about it in 1 Corinthians 14, where he says, basic, essentially, that the gift of prophecy is for the church, but the gift of tongues is for unbelievers. So, and this is what you see as an example in Acts chapter 2. So let's look at some of these Bible passages and let's, let's see what we're actually dealing with. Um, really, only three books of the Bible talk about the gift of tongues. There's of all, all the Bible, all the New Testament, even three books. The book of Mark, Jesus mentions it once. The book of Acts, it's in there several times. And the book of 1 Corinthians, you read about it in chapters 12 through 14. So um, that's essentially all we know about the gift of tongues comes from those passages. So in Mark chapter 16, I believe it's right around verse uh, 17 or so, Jesus talks about, you know, those that believe in me, they will speak with new tongues. So he's just talking about what's going to happen in the future. I believe we see the fulfillment of that in Acts 2. So we're going to go ahead and go to Acts chapter 2, take a peek at what this uh, gift of tongues is. Now, have you ever, well, you're familiar with the Pentecostal church, right, or the Pentecostal movement. Uh, many different churches take kind of the name Pentecostal. And why would they call themselves that? Because they believe that The essence of what God wants for us can be found in Acts chapter 2. And there's some power in Acts 2, I'll tell you that right now. In Acts 1, Jesus says, Hereafter you'll receive the Holy Spirit, and you shall receive what? 
power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, we see something miraculous happen, and uh, this is what's called the Pentecostal experience because this is the day of Pentecost. This is where the church just blossomed so fast. Okay, let's just read a few of the passages here. Verse, chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So at first, chapter 1 talks about how they got together. They were fellowshipping. They were in unity of the Spirit. You know, they, they had just chosen uh, a replacement for Judas. This is the 10 days after Jesus went to heaven. So he went to heaven. Ten days later, he's, this is experience is what's happening. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with what? The Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So now you have the apostles speaking in what? Tongues. Now that word speaking in tongues in Greek, the word is literally glossolalia, right? It's glossa, tongue, lalia, speak, speaking in tongues. And so, but it says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, immediately, where, whatever background you have, you're, you're already reading into this what's happening. But what I want to do is I want to stop whatever thought or process we've had, and let's actually read out of what, what's actually there. Okay, and let the Bible tells us, tell us what that speaking in tongue experience actually was. Verse 5, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak, what? In his own language. So now the apostles are speaking these different languages, and the people are just like shocked and saying, what's going on? Because we're hearing them speak in our own language. Verse 7, Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? So apparently they were well enough, known well enough to be pinpointed to not just, I mean, to a very specific part of the country. And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Now, do you, you hear the question they're asking? We are hearing them speak in our mother tongue. And not just our mother tongue, the word there is dialectos. It's, it's actually the word that means in our home language, our home dialect. So, you know, in, in America, we have different dialects, right? If you're from New York, you kind of talk a little different, right? You know, it's, it's, instead of down south, you kind of get y'all. Up north, it's yous. How yous doing? <laughs> you know, down south, it's how y'all doing? Or how, how, you, uh, how yuns doing? Or different dialects around the country. You get to know kind of where somebody's from. If somebody's from Boston, you, you know the, if they're from Boston or Chicago, you know. And so, uh, and, or from the South. That's what they knew. They knew that these accents, so they're hearing them speak not just with their local language. If I come in here and I'm, I'm speaking Irish, right? And speaking Irish, so I speak in English, but with an Irish accent. So I got a little bit of an Irish accent. I talk to you like this. Right away, you know where I'm from. I'm from Ireland, right? And so that would be um, what you, you would immediately know me as. So even though it was English, it was, so that's what I'm saying. These people were speaking the home language even with their own dialect. And it says, uh, and it lists them. It says in verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cap Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phygria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, joining the Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both, so that means probably Latin, uh, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, so it's Arabic. We hear them speak in our own tongues. Again, that, our own, that word tongues there simply means language, glossa, language. The wonderful works of God. How do they know what they were saying? Because they understood them in their home language. So there's a couple observations I want to bring out here. And that is that when they spoke in tongues, they were, spoken, they were speaking human languages. When they spoke in tongues, they were speaking things that could be understood. Is that clear from this passage? In fact, it lists what, almost 17, 16, 17 languages there. So it's no doubt that they understood what the wonderful works of God they were hearing. In fact, it was so powerful that the, later that day, there went on to be 3,000 souls that were converted. What were the messages given? Well, we know at least one of the sermons being preached by Peter. And I don't know what language Peter was preaching in, but we have it in, well, now in English, translated from Greek. But Peter's sermon talked about, 
you know, believing in Jesus and repenting of your sins and getting baptized. So Acts 2 really has a lot of power in there. But what we don't see in Acts 2 is something called a prayer language. Now, you've heard of a prayer language before if you're connected or heard of the Pentecostal movement or the charismatic movement. And that is where basically you go home, you're talking to God, you start speaking in an unintelligible language that only God knows. But do we see that in the Pentecostal experience? We don't. We see tongues being used to witness to unbelievers. And that's, what God, that's why God gave all the gifts. You know, he gave all the gifts to be tools to, to build up the church, to build up the, you know, to bring people into the church. Okay? Now, with that said, you can go to Acts chapter 10. I won't, I won't go through Acts chapter, Acts chapter 10 right now, uh, but you can read about the, read there at the beginning. Um, you have Cornelius was converted and his family. After they were converted, they spoke with tongues. And you can read about this in Acts 10 and verse uh, 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those, and those of the circumcision which believed were astonished, and as many as were present, or as many as came with Peter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So again, the tongues had to be understood because they were obviously magnifying God through what they were saying. Can anyone forbid? So, so they were speaking in tongues after their conversion. This is actually before their baptism. They were already speaking in, in other languages. And I believe God made these people missionaries. That's why they spoke in the other languages. And that's what, would, if God gave the gift of tongues today, it would be for that purpose. To communicate with a group of people that you don't speak their language. But God can miraculously give you the ability to speak that language, and that's what happened in Acts 2. It's what happened in Acts 10. You can also read about it in Acts chapter 19, uh, where, again, they, the Ephesian brethren received the gift of tongues. In fact, three times in the book of Acts, God gives the Holy Spirit um, to give them the gift of tongues to witness. Now, there's tons of experiences all through the book of Acts of people giving their lives to God, surrendering to the Lord, being born again, uh, being spirit-filled. No gift of tongues is mentioned. So it's obviously not something that every believer is to experience. And this is where I want to take you now to 1 Corinthians and chapter 12. 1 Corinthians and chapter 12. This is where probably we have um, 12 through 14 speaks more about the gift of tongues than anywhere else in the Bible. Well, like I mentioned, I just mentioned three books of the Bible. Mark, one mention. Acts, three mentions. Here in 1 Corinthians, three chapters that deal with it pretty thoroughly. Really two chapters, chapter 12 and chapter 14. Um, and remember, this is the, the, the Corinthian church has the true gift of tongues, which is a human language to witness, right? So what was happening is everybody was wanting to have this gift or that gift, and the Corinthian church was kind of messed up. And so Paul had occasion to rebuke them time and again. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. Let's skip on down to the very end. I can't, I'd love to just break it down verse by verse of the whole chapter. God says that the Holy Spirit gives the gifts as he wills. Not everybody has every gift. That's really the, the point of 1 Corinthians 12. He ends it like this in verse um, 28. And God has appointed those in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. Okay, this is kind of, so by the way, in the church, which is the greatest gift here? Apostles, which is what we would probably have modern day uh, like missionary administrators. These are the people that go out and focus on winning the loss, kind of organizing the work of missionary work, right? But then you have the, the prophets, second, t third teachers. But down at the very last of the gifts, the, like the bottom of the barrel, is the gift of tongues. And I wonder if the Apostle Paul knew how big uh, the last day, you know, the church in the last days would try to make the gift of tongues. So he puts it last. Verse 29, are all apostles? What's the answer? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rhetorical question. What's the answer? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have the gift of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. And, and, and that's the thing. Is we shouldn't have the expectation that all should speak with tongues because not everybody has the same gifts. Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And what's that more excellent way? Well, you've got to read 1 Corinthians 13, and the more excellent way is love, right? That's the whole point. Love, love. You know, you, you can have the best gifts, but no love, you got problems, okay? Now, skip over to 14 real quick, because I want to deal with a few verses in here. This is probably the most misunderstood chapter when it comes, 
well, almost to anything. I mean, just people read 1 Corinthians 14 uh, through the eyes of wanting to support uh, the idea of a prayer language. And so when they read it, they see that. Unfortunately, if you read the whole of 1 Corinthians 14, which we can't do this evening, you get the idea that Paul is rebuking the Corinthians for all the confusion they're creating about the gift of tongues. He's rebuking them. And yet some people take this rebuke and say, ha ha, this is, well, this is a good thing. Let's read it and I'll tell you what I'm talking about. First, verse 1, 14, 1. This is 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Pursue love, Paul says, and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may what? Prophet. You see the theme through the chapter, like prophesies better than tongues. He makes that point time and again. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Now, somebody's going to read this and say right there it tells us that when you're speaking in tongues, you're not speaking to people, but you're speaking to God. Now, the, but then remember, this is a rebuke. This is not saying, hey, this is a good thing. Because wouldn't that be a great thing if basically we can talk to God in his language? I think that'd be pretty awesome. But that's not what the gift of tongues is. Nowhere in the Bible do we see that as an example. What he's saying is, is that what's going on in the church is that there's people that are standing up here speaking Korean, and guess what? Nobody in the church speaks Korean. And so he's shutting them down saying, hey, stop it. You're creating problems. You have a gift. Okay, God gave you that gift. Praise God. Don't use that gift to create confusion. Talk to God, but don't talk to anybody else, right? Because you're just going to create problems. For no one understands them, it says. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mystery. He said, what you're saying is true, but it ain't helping anybody. He goes on, talks about prophecy, speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Now somebody says, ha, 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 right there, Wyatt. You, I'm showing you. Tongues will edify you. Here's the problem. The rest of the chapter tells you how bad that is. God doesn't give gifts to edify ourselves. God gives gifts to edify the church. God gives gifts so that the whole church can be blessed. And so if you're using a gift to edify yourself, all selfishly like, you're misusing the gift. Now remember, these are still talking about human languages, not a heavenly language. He who speaks in tongues edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. You see how he's contrasting it here? Yeah, your, your tongues that nobody's understanding you in? Yeah, only you're being edified. This gift of prophecy, this ministering of his word, this prophetic word, yeah, everybody's being edified through that. Now watch this now. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless he indeed he interprets. Unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. He says the only time that anybody should ever be speaking in tongues, at home, at work, at school, or even at church. The only time anybody should ever speak in tongues is if there's an interpretation. Is that clear? Unless people can understand you. But now, brethren, I come to you speaking, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you by either revelation or knowledge or prophesying or by teaching, even things without life, whether flute or harp? When they make a sound, unless they make a distinction of the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? If I go over to the piano and I start hitting away those keys but making no sense, you're not going to sing along. <laughs> he says, no, it's the same way with languages. If you're not saying words that people can understand, there's no point in it. For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who prepares for the battle? So likewise, and here's the point Paul's getting to, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? So when you speak in tongues, how are you supposed to speak? Words that are not understood? No. Words that are easy to understand. So what's happening is in the Corinthian church, this is a melting pot of cultures. You have people there speaking all these different languages. Everybody wanted to use their gift, but, you know, most of the people spoke Greek. And so that's the language that, you know, they should have been focusing on the most. But hey, you know what? I got Arabic. You know, assalamu alaikum. And nobody's getting blessed by that. Nobody understands that. He says, likewise, unless you utter by tongue, eat words easy to be understand. How will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. Now, they, everybody's going to quote the verse at the beginning. It says you're speaking to God, right? But they don't quote the verse about just speaking into the air. You just, you know, listen, God understands what you're saying. If, if I stand up here today and I start speaking, you know, German. Ein, zwei, drei, fünf, sechs, see, I left something out. I'm trying to count to ten in German. That's all I know. So, if I stand up here trying to talk and nobody's understanding me, I'm just talking to the air, right? There are maybe so many different kinds of languages in the world. Again, we're talking human languages, not a heavenly language. 
and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I'll be a foreigner to him who speaks. King James says a barbarian, you know, bar, 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 bar. And he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. You see the point is he's talking about tongues? He says, stop it unless you're blessing somebody. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So you come in the church, you got a message, but your message is in German. Pray to God to give you the ability to communicate that to the people in the church. For if I pray in a tongue, I stand up here and we're going to open up in prayer today. I pray in a tongue. My spirit prays, right? But my understanding is unfruitful. By the way, it's not saying like my understanding. You read this in the Greek. My understanding is not talking about I don't understand it. It means my understandability is unfruitful. Nobody's understanding me. You'll get this in just a second. What's the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding, making sure people can understand me. I will sing with the Spirit. Same thing when you stand up here singing a song. It, sometimes it really frustrates me when you get somebody up here, they, got, they can sing beautifully in Spanish. So they get up here and sing a beautiful Spanish song. But I can't understand Spanish. I miss the blessing. I want the blessing too. Like put the words on the screen or something. Like I, I, want, I want to be able to connect with that song like everybody else, and, or who, everybody else who can speak Spanish. Um, I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, if I say, que Dios te bendiga, I think I said that right in Spanish. Anybody in here speak Spanish? Nobody. Okay, so I have no idea if I got that right or not. Right or not. Que Dios te bendiga. I think it means God bless you in Spanish. Um, Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't understand what you say? So nobody in here said amen after I said que Dios te bendiga. Because you didn't know what I said, right? But if you did, maybe you'd say it back. So Paul's saying here, look, are you getting my point? He, I mean, he, 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 he makes it clear. Make sure when you're communicating, you're doing it in a language that people understand. Otherwise, I just read that, um, verse 17, For indeed you give thanks well. You know what you're saying. You're giving thanks. Right? Shakrun. That's Arabic for thank you. Shakrun jazilan. Thank you very much. I study a little bit. But nobody understands that. So you can't say amen. For indeed you give thanks well, but the others not edify. And that's what the gifts are for, to edify. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding, or again, five words that people can understand me, that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue, really, that nobody can understand. And he goes on and on and on. He, he, just, he talks about tongues are for a sign for those who are not believers. Somebody comes in and, all, and the church is rattling off, going crazy, right? T speaking different languages. Remember, this was in Corinth when they were speaking in real language, human languages, all over the church. And he says, somebody's going to come in and see that and say, you're all mad. They're going to leave. He said, let everything be done decently in order. If you do have a gift of tongues, and you have a message for the church in that language, you, you wait your turn and you make sure there's an interpreter. You, and you're not going to let you read that on your own time. But the whole point of the whole chapter is verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Does that make sense? Now, I say this real, I realize that many, many people perhaps has had an experience in their life in which maybe the, at the side of their bed or they, they're copying their parents or, or I, in my case, I was holding hands in a, in a prayer group and the, and the preacher says, repeat after me. And he says, you know, I'm Yama Yashima. And we all go, hmm. He said, say it again. Yama Yama Yashima. And he, would, and he would go on, and he would, and, he, and next thing you know, when, I didn't do any of this stuff, but I mean, I'm like, because this is like freaking me out. So I stand back, and everybody else is going on. And next thing you guys, you got people flopping on the floor and, and dancing around and shouting things. And, and uh, this was in county jail, by the way. So I'm like, they're going to, guards are going to come in and just mace us all or something, you know. So I, <laughs> we're crazy. It looked like a crazy thing in there. But this is what um, I was told what the gift of tongues is. And you can't teach somebody the gift of tongues, it's something God gives you to edify the church. And if you're edifying yourself with it, then you're probably misusing the gift. And, uh, but this is a gift, I think, that's a very important gift. I think we're actually going to see more of this in the last days. Um, I think the reason we haven't seen a lot of it is because God gives people the ability to learn languages. The apostles didn't have that privilege of learning languages to be, go reach all the world. They were all there from all around the world. The apostles spoke these languages, and then they were converted. They, these people went back home. And guess what? The gospel spread very fast that way. The gift of tongues is a, is a wonderful, miraculous language. But let's not confuse it with something. By the way, what's the evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit? I've been told 
more than more than a hundred times, hundreds of times, I've been told that the gift of the gift of tongues is the evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. I submit to you that Jesus said, "By this shall all men know you are my disciples, by the love you have for one another." I submit to you that it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the gifts, but the fruit that Satan can't counterfeit. Satan can counterfeit the gifts, but the fruit he can't counterfeit: love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and self control. Right? So. Let us demonstrate. By the way, if you, if you want assurance of salvation, and that's why a lot of people keep doing this, because like, as long as I'm doing this, I can be committing adultery, I can be stealing, but as long as I'm speaking in tongues, I'm going to heaven. I've heard this. I've had people tell me this. But if you really want an assurance of salvation, read the book of 1 John. The whole book's written, designed to give you a confidence in your relationship with God. Okay? And that confidence is not found in some act. It's found in that connection you have with Jesus that bears fruit to eternal life.